just raise your virtual hand. And thanks a lot for being here. The floor is yours. And go ahead. Okay, thanks for having me here. So um, this is a, a project in collaboration with Bank Nagara. So um, so of course, uh, we know that uh, the COVID-19 is one of the most significant events of the 20, 21st century. So um, it's unprecedented in many ways and have huge dis disruption to GDP, inflation, unemployment, and trade. Um, interestingly, there are some uh, recent paper in last year that um, noted that the fiscal curve relation appeared to have steepened post-COVID uh, relative to the pre-COVID era in, in some country. Um, but the three studies that I mentioned here, they mostly focus on the one country and none of them have looked at developing countries. Um, so the aim of this paper would be to look at fiscal relation in Malaysia and see whether it has changed um, post-COVID. So um, it diverges from existing study in two, two ways. The first is that uh, it takes into consideration of fuel price uh, using retail fuel price index instead of international oil price. Uh, in the sense that if you look at the existing study, when they look at uh, any country, they usually directly use the international oil price or convert the international oil price in local currency term. Okay? But uh, in the case of Malaysia, that would not be appropriate because we, we know that Malaysia has substantial subsidy to fuel price. So here I will use the retail fuel price index. Um, second would be that um, I'm using money data in this paper. Uh, because I want to have enough observation to separate the sample into pre, pre and post COVID sample. Okay? So, uh, of course, uh, in terms of digital review, we know that Phyllis Curve takes back to Phyllis 1958 paper, uh, for which it looked at UK data and discovered there's a negative relation between nominal wage inflation and unemployment rate. Um, subsequently, Samuelson and Solo find that the negative relation also hold between price inflation and unemployment rate in the US and name the relation the Phyllis curve. Um, by 1970, um, researchers noted a breakdown of the original Phyllis curve. Uh, and so they modified the original Phyllis curve by augmenting the Phyllis curve with expectation, uh, specifically expected inflation. And by 1980s, uh, the, there are the new Keynesian models, um, which use micro foundation and that gives rise to new Keynesian Phyllis curve or NKPC. So uh, in a typical NKPC, the current inflation will depend on expected inflation marginal cost. Um, Gardy and Gertler um, is the famous paper that estimate a hybrid NKPC using the US data. And here hybrid means that in addition to the um, expected inflation marginal cost, Guardian and Gertler add the lag inflation as an additional term in the, in the NKPC. Um, they find that expected inflation is more important than lag inflation in the NKPC for the US. Um, subsequently, um, Guardian et al. in 2001 find similar results for the euro area. Um, NKPC has also been extended to take into consideration the other aspect of the economy. Um, so here I listed two examples of my own paper with Thomas Lupik. Um, so in our 2012 paper, we look at inventory investment and in 2014 paper, we look at fit habits. Uh, for open economic extension, um, Patini and all look at relative price of imported input, foreign competition pressure, and permanent adjustment cost for the UK. And they find that the relative price of imported input um, is positive and significant in the specification. Uh, Mihailov at all 2011 include terms of trade for 10 OECD country and find support that in seven of those countries, terms of trade matters for the uh, Phyllis curve. Uh, Hobson at all document the absolute value of the estimated coefficient of un unemployment gaps in a sample of 29 industrial countries have become larger in the post COVID era. Uh, Hardin and all subsequently construct a DSGE model with quasi king demand schedule, uh, which, which is able to generate a nonlinear phase curve. Uh, 
to explain the flattening of the Phillies curve in the United States during the Great Recession and steepening of the Phillies curve in the post-COVID era. Um, Benigno and Eggerson construct a new Keynesian model with such a matching friction, which is also able to generate a non-linear Phillies curve and cap capable of explaining the recent steepening of the Phillies curve in the United States in the post-COVID era. So for Malaysia, uh, there are only some limited study of uh, Phillies curve for Malaysia. Uh, for example, for Rocco 2007, uh, he constructed the ECM model of inflation and unemployment rate and find long-run relation between these two variables. Uh, Tan and Lin uh, also constructed a VECM with and without additional con uh, control variable like output gap MI, uh, M1, and find long-run relation between these variables. Uh, Foroka and Harvey estimate the hybrid version of NKPC and find that coefficient on expected inflation and net inflation to be both positive and statistically significant with larger coefficient on expected inflation. So this result by itself is quite similar to, to my result here. Uh, but they find that the coefficient on output gap to be insignificant. So this, this will be something that I, I'll find different result compared to uh, their contribution. Um, Furukan and Munir uh, use a panel coin integration to study the relation between inflation and unemployment rate in five ASEAN countries, including Malaysia, but that is panel. Um, but they find no wrong, wrong run relation for, for those panel of five ASEAN countries. Agano and Beirakta constructed open economy NKPC for eight middle income countries, including Malaysia. And in their study, open economy variable include oil price and real exchange rate. Uh, for the case of Malaysia, they find that lag inflation is more important than expected inflation in the open economy and KPC. So this result will be uh, different compared to my result here. Uh, but also, also the same if you consider the pre-COVID uh, sample. Which one? Uh, this one. Oh, so... Um, Boroka, I think usually either annual data or quarterly data. Yeah. yeah. And, and you can see from the list of literature, they are all mostly before 2018. So in terms of sample period, it'll be different as well. Uh, in Agano and Beirata, the oil price and real exchange trade are statistically insignificant. So for the oil price, for example, again, like what I mentioned uh, before, when they use oil price, they are using international oil price without taking into consideration that for Malaysia, uh, the government has substantial subsidy to the oil price, to, to the retail oil price. Okay? So that, that may be one reason they, they find oil price to be statistically insignificant. Um, Baharam Shah et al. used micro switching open economy and KPC model for eight Asian economy, including Malaysia, for 1980 to 2018. So this is annual data. Uh, open economy variable include US dollar exchange rate, global inflation rate, and global output gap. Um, they find that non-linear micro switching model outperform, outperform alternative linear model, and the three open economy variable are statistically significant for the case of Malaysia. Uh, Chong and Ho from Benagara, they investigate how open economy variable, including global slack, commodity prices, and exchange rate, affect Phillips curve relation in a panel of 14 Asia-Pacific economy, including Malaysia, using annual data. Um, they find that global slack, commodity prices, and exchange rate are important determinants of domestic inflation rate for Asia-Pacific economies. So overall, out of these seven public studies on Phillips curve from Malaysia, only three studies have explicitly considered open economy factors. Only one study has considered non-linear model. And all seven studies make use of either quarterly and annual data. And none of them have considered post-COVID era. So those are the areas for which I will innovate um, compared to them. So I will include open economy factors. Um, I also consider a simple non-linear extension. Uh, I use money data, and I also consider post-COVID year. Okay. So uh, in terms of methodology, I use a hybrid new Keynesian Phillips curve. Um, specifically, current inflation depends on 
last period inflation depends on expected next period inflation plus VT. VT here is driving force. Uh, so this driving force can be in terms of output gap, can be, can be in terms of unemployment rate, um, or in guardian Gertler, it will be marginal cost. Uh, so most of the literature focus on the US and other advanced country, and they, they consider case of closed economy, and VT will be proxy by either output gap or labor income share. So labor income share in, in their framework will be corresponding to marginal cost. So um, we consider open economy factors too in, in this uh, paper, uh, specifically the dollar ring exchange rate and the import price. And again, um, since the focus is on comparison of fiscal relation pre and post COVID, we use money data and we look at CPI inflation rate in Malaysia. Uh, we also add percentage change of fuel price as part of the drying cost. Um, this is because Fuel price is important component of the CPI basket, around 7 to 8% of the CPI basket. Uh, more specifically, I use the so-called fuels and lubricating equipment from CPI. So this is subcomponent of CPI. Uh, and I use this because that can directly show what is the retail price uh, for, for that component uh, in Malaysia. Okay. So again, this is the first in the literature, uh, considering that others assisting us did they use international oil price. So just a clarifying question. The the driving force in this case, the exchange rate and the import price is is lag one period or is it the same period as the um for exchange rate and import price and fuel price, they are all current period. Okay. So uh, so the equation that I estimate here would be something like this. So yt is the output gap. So I have the um, fuel price inflation rate percentage change of exchange rate, and also import price uh, inflation rate. Okay. So for the pi T, it will be month-on-month uh, -month CPI inflation, headline inflation rate. Um, YT is output gap measured as log industrial output deviation from its HP filtered trend. Um, pi, pi fuel is the month-on-month -month percentage change of fuel price in the CPI basket. Um, delta ET is a percentage change of US dollar ringgit exchange rate, increase in the delta ET is ringgit depreciation. So ringgit depreciation should push out the inflation rate, so I expect alpha phi to be positive. Uh, um, the the left-hand side variable is inflation rate. Okay, so what matters to the inflation rate should be the percentage change of the exchange rate rather than the level itself. So, uh, high T import is month on month percentage change of import unit value index from DOSM. Uh, this import uh, unit value from DOSM, admittedly, is not the, the best variable to use because the, the import unit value index can also include. Um, imported price of imported intermediate input or price of imported capital goods. Okay, but for consumption basket, supposedly we want only the imported consumption goods, but there's no such data, so I, I can only use this one from uh, from Dawson. Um, to in investigate the non linearity, uh, I investigate version with additional interaction term, which is. Uh, inflation interact with the drying force, which in, in, in the model will be output gap. Um, this is to capture the idea from Hardin that the responsiveness of the inflation to the forcing variable may depend on the level of inflation. Specifically, maybe um, when the inflation rate is high, the reaction to output gap may be larger. So for instrument, I use three legs of inflation rate, um, two legs of drying force, the output gap or unemployment cycle. Uh, the percentage change of fuel price, percentage change of exchange rate, percentage change of import price, uh, all this as instrument. So I also estimate version of, of the model where IT is replaced by month-on-month -month CPI core inflation and version where YT is replaced by deviation of money unemployment rate from its HP filter trend. So methodology GMM, sample period, full sample is 2005 
month four to 2023, month eight. Um, I started with 2005, month four, because of the availability of the uh, fuel and replicating equipment. That, that, was, that is only available starting from 2005, month one. Okay? And considering the lack, so I only um, start with 2005, month four. So pre-COVID sample will be 2005, month four to 2020, month two. So that is before MCO in Malaysia. And post-COVID will be 2020, month three to 2023, month eight. So uh, starting from the MCO period. Sorry, uh, what's the major uh, inflation expectations? Is it like a professional forecasters? Okay, so, so um, the, the methodology that we use is GMM. So in GMM, basically, we make use of the assumption of rational expectation. So the expected inflation basically make use of the moment condition that the error term in the equation need to be not correlated with any variable dated uh, either T and B. So it's not a direct measurement of the expectation. It's, it's making use of the assumption of rational expectation and that the assumption of rational expectation means that your forecast error should not be correlated with any variable that is dated T or B4. So, so this is the standard uh, approach use in GMM when, when they come to estimate the NKPC, the mean tangent of the risk curve, which is to make use of rational expectation assumption. Um, now, of course, it would be much better if we also have some direct observation of the expected inflation, like survey data, but unfortunately, it's not available for money. Uh, most of them are available for only for like quarterly or Monthly in the sense of from now until next year. So like uh, March right now, what is the expected inflation from March now until next year March? But that would not be consistent with what I'm trying to estimate here. Uh, what I'm trying to estimate here is month on month rather than year on year using other data. Based on the estimation, you consider the um, I would say it, it, it is a short run model. Um, it, it's not really looking at like quantification type of thing. Yeah. So it's. Also, you're trying to look at the uh, Phillips curve relation before COVID and after COVID, right? But then wouldn't it make sense to impute like six months, like from April 2020 to say October, because the. There's like a literature which is saying that the variation is so large that it would dominate the coefficients afterwards. So you're not really measuring the pre and post, but that shock in the middle kind of dominates the observations afterwards. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Uh, that 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 may be a good point, which is that perhaps I can start the post COVID sample slightly later, like maybe. Uh, 2020, month nine or month 10, yeah, yeah. to avoid uh, the, the, the first few initial months. Um, yeah, that, that, that I can consider doing. All right, so, um, so these are the results. <clears throat> so uh, the, the, the first table here has the version with first the traditional NKPC without any control variable. Panel B here is with only the fuel price, okay? so without the exchange or import price. Okay? So uh, first column here is the full sample. Second column here, pre-COVID sample. Third column here, the post-COVID sample. Okay? So first look at the lag inflation. So interestingly, lag inflation is positively significant for full sample. Is positive and significant for the uh, pre COVID sample, but it's not significant for the post COVID sample. In contrast, expected inflation is positive and significant for the whole sample, not significant for the pre COVID sample, but positive and significant for the post COVID sample. Okay, so we, we immediately see that there are differences in the sense that. Lag inflation is significant for pre-COVID, but not for post-COVID. 
expected inflation is significant for post-COVID, but not pre-COVID. Okay. Uh, output gap in this traditional version without any control variable is significant in the post-COVID sample, but not in pre-COVID and uh, for the full sample. Okay. So this slide itself is also consistent with flattening of the Phillies curve uh, pre-COVID and steepening of the Phillies curve post-COVID. The, the flattening and steepening is really referring to the, the coefficient on output gap. Um, when we include the fuel price as an additional control variable, the fuel price are statistically significant for all three uh, sample period. Okay? Um, in terms of the lab inflation and expected inflation, the, the pattern are the same, which is that lab inflation is significant pre-COVID, not significant post-COVID. Expected inflation is significant post-COVID, not significant pre-COVID. An output gap is also uh, significant for post-COVID, but not before. Okay? So again, there are different um, there are significant difference between the pre-COVID and post-COVID period in terms of which variable are significant. Uh, sorry, the fuel price that you include here, is it subsidized fuel price or unsubsidized? Retail fuel price. Retail. So okay. it's already so it's subsidized. Yeah. Okay. I've already mentioned all this. Um, table two is um, showing the version with exchange rate and also import price. But interestingly here, uh, even though the exchange rate import price, they are all uh, positive, which is consistent with what we should expect them to be, but they are not significant in, um, in all the sample here. Um, in terms of the lag inflation and expected inflation output gap, the pattern are same as what we have before, which is that lag inflation is significant pre-COVID, but not significant post-COVID. Expected inflation significant post-COVID, not significant pre-COVID, except for this version, slightly marginally significant. And output gap is significant post-COVID, but not pre-COVID. Okay. Um, So um, I take the, the part about lag inflation and expected inflation to be a new result in the sense that uh, in the literature, because most study, even for advanced country, they do not make use of monthly data. So they, they cannot separate out the pre-COVID versus post-COVID. So, so they don't have the result that lag inflation is uh, significant pre-COVID and not, and not significant post-COVID or expected inflation, whether it's significant or not significant pre or post-COVID. Uh, so overall, I would say that the result shows that expected inflation has become more important in the Phillies curve relation for Malaysia post-COVID. Um, this part is where I add the uh, interaction term, in inflation multiplied by the output gap. Okay. Um, overall, this interaction term is not significant in all the version. Okay, so so all these version are for, for using all the, the full sample, full sample, uh, and then it's just differ on which control variable is included. So the first column, no control variable, second column, only fuel price, third column, fuel price and exchange rate, and then the fourth column, uh, fuel price, exchange rate, import price. Okay? So again, uh, interaction term not significant, but in terms of the other variable, uh, output gap is only marginally significant when there, when there is the fuel price and exchange rate. Okay? So, so what we can conclude from table three here is that adding the interaction term does not seem to be able to capture the non-linearity um, or, or the fact that there is fractioning of the Phillies curve pre-COVID and steepening of the Phillies curve post-COVID. Okay? Okay, so this one, this version is where we uh, exclude the expected inflation. So we, we consider a purely backward looking Phillies curve. So the idea would be that uh, without that expected inflation term, all the variable will be dated T or before, 
then uh, we do not have to use GMM. We can just proceed with the OLS estimation. So, um, the result here shows that output gap, uh, sorry, sorry, the, the, the lag inflation is uh, significant, positively significant for the full sample, positively significant for a pre COVID sample. But interestingly, here, when there's no um, additional control variable, the lag inflation is negative and marginally significant. Uh, output gap in the purely forward, purely backward looking version are significant for all three samples. Okay? Uh, when fuel price is added, fuel prices continue to be significant for all the version. Uh, lag inflation become insignificant when fuel price added, but output gap continue to be significant for all three version. Okay. So uh, the result of the purely backward looking version uh, differ from the NKPC version where there is expected inflation. Uh, but personally, I still prefer the NKPC version because um, it, it, can, it can consider whether expected inflation matter or not. Uh, so that that should mean that the fuel price inflation has been a lot, right? Yeah, the fuel price inflation has been has been a lot relative to without fuel price. Um, but interestingly, uh, even for this purely backward looking version, when you compare the output gap, okay, so post COVID, the estimated coefficient of output gap is three times the magnitude of pre COVID. Okay, so even for the purely backward looking version, we have the steepening of the Phillips curve post COVID. So um, this version will be the version with um, the percentage change of exchange rate and also the import price. Um, again, fuel price are, con are statistically significant for all version. Um, output gap are still larger uh, for the post-COVID version. Uh, lag inflation significant in the pre-COVID sample, but not significant post-COVID in this purely backward looking version. Okay, um, for this part, I uh, replace the headline inflation with core inflation and see what will happen. Um, so here we are back to the NKPC version with expected inflation. Um, for lag inflation, without any control variable, is positive and significant for all the sample. Uh, but expected inflation, the coefficients are larger compared to the lag inflation. Okay. Output gap, uh, significant pre-COVID, but not significant post-COVID for this version without control variable. But with fuel price, interestingly, fuel price is significant only for pre-COVID, but not significant for uh, post-COVID or the full sample, okay? So the way we interpret this is that this is looking at core inflation. So core inflation by itself should have removed the fuel price, okay? But um, for the pre-COVID, it's still significant. That means that changes in the fuel price are truth to the core inflation. So how do we explain this? Uh, perhaps one reason for that would be that uh, during 2015 to 2018, Malaysia has a period where the government removed the fuel subsidy. Okay, so, so that period, the fuel price changes will be uh, larger. And perhaps that is why that fuel price change also passed through the core, to, to the core inflation. Whereas post-COVID, Malaysia is back with the subsidy for fuel price. So perhaps that is why uh, the fuel price uh, 
that's not how passed through through the coil. So, yeah. and how do you interpret the, the, the coefficient related with the previous inflation and expectation? Because in the baseline, you highlight this pattern that the previous inflation doesn't matter for 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 COVID and. Yeah, so, so um, when we look at headline inflation, the, the, basically the result was that lab inflation matters for pre-COVID, uh, but do not matter for post-COVID. But when we, when we look at uh, core inflation, here the result is that um, without any control variable, lab inflation matters for both pre-COVID and post-COVID. Uh, but if we include the fuel price, lag inflation is not significant for pre-COVID and only significant for the post-COVID. So, yeah. so, so, so the idea would be that core inflation behavior is different from the headline inflation. So for the core inflation, it, it can be, so for, for the, for the post-COVID period, it could be uh, somewhat sticky as well, somewhat persistent, but, but at the same time, it's also forward-looking. At the same time. So again, they are referring to two, two different inflation. One is headline inflation, one is core inflation. So, so their behavior could be different. For this fuel price, so um, for this year, the, the government is expected to have um, the subsidy rationalization for, for fuel price, maybe starting with diesel. So then perhaps um, we, can, we, we might see that the fuel price changes will be passed through to core inflation. So this is just one possibility. So um, lab inflation and expected inflation are both positive and statistically significant in the post-COVID sample in all the specification, but with the estimated coefficient and expected inflation larger than those of the lab inflation. So core inflation has become more persistent and more forward-looking in the post-COVID period. With the forward looking component exerting larger influence. Uh, this is where we include the exchange rate import prices. Uh, more or less, it's, it's the same for the post COVID, both the lag and all the and the expected inflation matters, but the coefficient on the expected inflation uh, are larger. Uh, U.S. dollar ring exchange rate is marginally significant, significant in the version where percentage change of import price is also added as a control variable, but insignificant otherwise. Uh, import price is not significant for all the sample. And again, uh, the reason, perhaps one reason why import price does not matter would be that the import price includes the imported capital goods or intermediate input, uh, which may not matter as much for, for, con for CPI. Uh, when fuel and replicating equipment price is added as a control variable, AppleCat is positive and significantly significant in the full sample and post COVID sample. So, when core inflation is used as a measure of inflation rate, steepening of this curve is only observed when fuel and replicating equipment price inflation is added as a control variable. Okay, um, this part. I replace the output gap with unemployment cycle, which is um, deviation of unemployment un 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 rate from the HP filter trend. Um, so we see that, for example, uh, when there is no control variable, unemployment cycle is not significant. But once we add the fuel price inflation, the unemployment cycle is negative and statistically, statistically significant post COVID, but not. But, but not pre-COVID, okay? So this part by itself is also consistent with the turning of the Fiddy's curve post-COVID. Uh, expected inflation, significant post-COVID, but not pre-COVID. Um, when there's no other control variable, lab inflation is uh, significant pre-COVID and post-COVID, but um, here is larger for the for the post COVID, but this is using unemployment as a cycle, so so the result um, may be different compared to output gap. 
but once we add in the exchange rate import price, uh, unemployment cycle continue to be significant, negative and significant for uh, post COVID, but the lag inflation term uh, become insignificant post COVID and, and pre COVID. And only the expected inflation term is uh, marginally significant for, for this version with exchange rate. So um, the result is still consistent with steepening of the Phillies curve when we use unemployment cycle in the sense that the unemployment cycle is only significant for post-COVID sample. So conclusion, um, the, when we use this GMM approach, we do find that um, there is fractioning of this curve pre-COVID for Malaysia. Uh, Post-COVID, the coefficient on output get unemployment cycle becomes significant again. Um, expected inflation become more significant post-COVID, maybe because of the higher global inflation feeds into the expected inflation, and that in turn change the price setting behavior of the firms. So policy implication would be that uh, it would be more important for the for Bank Nagar Malaysia to ensure inflation expectation uh, to be well anchored. Um, one important limitation of this study would be that we only use a GMM approach uh, because we do not have monthly data on expected inflation. Um, specifically, I, I would like to have the month-on-month expected inflation, uh, but so far there is no such data. So if any fiscal agency or research organization can start collect this data, that would be very helpful. Um, yeah, that's basically the, the, the paper. Thank you very much. Any more questions? <laughs> Um, what they so what the literature called the flattening of Phillips curve means that in the Phillips curve the coefficient on unemployment or on the output gap to be smaller or insignificant. So that that is what they refer to as the flattening of Phillips curve. So it's very a puzzle before COVID that they, they when they estimate the Phillips curve, quite often they find that out the coefficient output gap or even sometimes on the unemployment to be insignificant. So meaning that the, the Phillips curve seems to only depends on the lag inflation or expected inflation, but the driving force itself is insignificant. But what they do observe is that, uh, so for example, here I mentioned about, uh, this paper by, so this paper by Hopjin at all, actually this is not a full-blown regression paper. For this paper by Hopjin, they are actually only uh, plotting the, the scatter plot of, of the data for unemployment gaps versus inflation uh, for, for this advanced country. So for the post-COVID era, they are only like very few data on, but they still can show that the coefficient or the slope to be a lot steeper compared to the pre-COVID. Okay, so uh, again, in the literature, the so-called steepening is only referring to the, the coefficient on output gap or on un unemployment gap. Sorry. 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 Are we relying on the Phillips curve? Perhaps we should ask Bank of <laughs> uh, I, I guess Phillips curve will always be uh, one model that policymaker will use as a reference. I mean, but how, how much weight they put into that, 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 that of course, will, will be, depends on the, the central bank or, or the ministry themselves on how much they want to believe that.
I, I have a question. I mean, part of the motivation of this is that you say there are many studies for advanced economies, not really for emerging economies. So the, the first question is, like in one sentence, how your research for Malaysia are different from advanced economies? And also how your research for Malaysia can apply to other emerging economies? And I would say the, the last question is, how country-specific factors in Malaysia might affect these results? For example, the, the lack of an inflation target. How, 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 how this could affect these results? Uh, to be honest, I, I don't know. I, I haven't tried using other developing country data. I have started working on the US, trying to use my new data, but that is still in progress. Because what I learned from my undergrad courses is, so, uh, is that you also use the output gap, but also the inflation gap, basically how you deviate from the from from the target, right? And I guess I mean here you you cannot apply that, and that's why you are using other measures for the expectation, right? Mm -hmm. Any other question? So I mean, as you you know well, I mean even before the pandemic, I mean there have been debates on the, the usefulness of the the this curve I mean, globally, I mean, and, and I remember one of the very famous paper by Christine Forbes in 2019, uh, she presented the paper, the Brookings uh, discussion, and the, 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 I, I checked the title and the inflation dynamics that dormant or determined abroad. And her conclusion was the Phillips curve is still alive and but determined I mean, by the external forces. So, I was wondering whether, you know, I mean, if, if I just follow your empirical results, then your conclusion is before the pandemic, I mean, the flip score was dormant or maybe dead for the pandemic, but after the pandemic, it's become alive and stable. So, I mean, I, I'm wondering whether, you know, following her, her conclusion, uh, whether the, the results are robust when you include some global output and, and the other variables. I understand you, you included exchange rates, right. import prices, as well as fuel prices. But the main focus of the flip curve is the relation between uh, inflation and, and demand side output. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yes, indeed, in the literature, there is um, the literature of estimating the Phillips curve using both domestic output gap and global output gap. There is already such a literature. Uh, but for the purpose here, um, I'm not going that route because I'm more interested to, to understand uh, specifically op open economy variable, specifically the exchange rate and import price, and how that affects the risk curve. Technically speaking, if I want it, I can also construct a global output gap and see how that uh, affect Malaysia and KPC. If I want, I can do that. Um, and, and as I mentioned in the literature, uh, there are some researchers from Bank Nagar that has done that using panel data, which means that they are combining different country data from Asia Pacific and using the global output gap versus domestic output gap uh, way of trying to model that. And what one question is, you know, interpretations of the um, the infl inflation expectations, uh, expected inflation. You, 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 you technically explained, you know, that's the kind of explained, the unexplained part from the GMM model. But um, economically speaking, you know, I mean, what, what makes so the difference between pre COVID and post COVID in the role of the inflation expectations? Again, you know, does that kind of reflect some like, you know, synchronized you know, economic forces such as global supply chains, disruptions, and, you know, COVID pandemic and, and, and then surge in global inflation in 2021. What's your uh, interpretations of the expected inflation? Okay, so my, my best guess would be that the reason will be uh, something along the, the, the line of non linear phase curve, where the response of inflation to output gear or unemployment cycle may be larger if inflation is larger. But Surprisingly, when I try to in include that interaction term, the interaction term is insignificant. So perhaps the model will have to, have to be more complicated than that to, to capture that non-linearity for, for the case of Malaysia. There's a... Yeah. 
es que es cuadrado, no es que es. Es Juan, es Juan. Es Juan, es Juan. Y Uh, interact is multiplication, right? Multiplication is non-linear. So it, it's non-linear in, in output gap. Yeah, it's non-linear in output gap. Any other question? Yeah. Only one. No, nah, just, just kidding. No, no, just kidding. question how is the output gap constructed um, is simply deviation of the log industrial output from its HP filter trend okay, so, so that's what I do for the output gap second question regarding whether I'm capturing the period of instability whether there's structural break uh, again for the post COVID sample I guess I can start with a different time period maybe six months into the COVID instead of what I do right now, which is starting with the MCO period. What you mentioned about GFC, technically speaking, I can also do that, which is different starting period, maybe post GFC. Uh, I'm actually working on something along that line, which is more of a uh, growing regression of, of the, the whole thing. I still work in progress. Okay, if there is no more questions, let's finish here. Um, there are some refreshments outside, so uh, feel free to, to, to talk to Theo. And thanks a lot for your time and for a very interesting presentation. Thank you.